It's been said that life is a journey. And what we believe informs the choices we make on the path. The things we see, hear, and experience can have a profound impact. But ultimately, our faith is just that, ours. So um, before I start today, I wanted to just spend a minute in prayer, especially for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, is uh, a lot of these people being displaced, they're, they're also believers, and they're being pushed out of their country, and I'm also going to pray that, that God intervenes in Putin's life and Russian's life. And uh, I certainly would invite you to do that. So I want to have, actually ask you to stand for a minute. And uh, let's pray for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. And let's ask that God intervenes in a powerful way like David cried out uh, for against his enemy, saying, Lord, do something. And we want to pray and, and, and just commit this to him. And I say that because I've been on the phone this week with several people from Romania and Poland uh, dealing with this crisis. And it just breaks my heart when you hear the stories of the kids coming with no shoes and it's freezing cold out there and jackets and lots of tears and the displacement. And uh, we just, we can commit it to God. Heavenly Father, we come before you as a church body and together we pray as one voice that you, God, will intervene in Ukraine, that you will intervene in the lives of these people there. We pray, God, for protection, for peace, we pray, God, that you will be their covering. God, we lift up especially our brothers and sisters there, our brother and sister Christians who are crying out to you right now. God, please be present in their lives and provide for them however you do. I also pray against Russia, specifically Vladimir Putin. I pray, God, that you will bring an end to his reign of terror. The God, that you will move in his leaders' lives, that you will intervene in a profound way there, God, that we have to give you the glory for. God, we know that you deal with people on your level. We just ask from our perspective, God, that you bring this to an end. We give you all praise and all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It always just breaks my heart when you, when you see things like that happening and you hear the stories. And, and for me, when I'm hearing them firsthand, um, it just kind of tears you up. But we know that God is still on his throne. So today I'm doing a series or continuing on this series called Own It. And it's all about owning your faith. See, I can't grow spiritually for you. You have to grow yourself. I can't exercise for you. You can't exercise for me. You have to own it. And when it comes to spiritual growth, you have to own your own spiritual growth. You have to learn how to feed yourself or you will always be stuck. You need to learn how to feed yourself so this week I was reading an article in the New York Times that was just fascinating to me. They talked about uh, Yale cognitive scientist Lori Santos started teaching a college course called Psychology and the Good Life. She started teaching this course, Psychology and the Good Life, in 2018. And all of the professors, the faculty, didn't really know how students would take this. These are some of the best, brightest students in the country. And what they found was fascinating. The class actually filled up. Now it is the favorite class amongst all freshmen. At least 25% of the students at Yale take this class. And so they tried to figure out why are they so interested in this class? Is it because uh, these are all, all bright students and they want to learn the psychology behind happiness and a good life? Or, or what was it? What, what is drawing them to it? And what they found was also interesting. They found that the students who take this class, as well as many others, but particularly the students who take this class, are missing something. Or maybe never had it. They're longing for this one thing. Satisfaction. These students don't have a purpose. And it's causing great confusion and anxiety in the next, especially the next generation. They can't find satisfaction. 
I read another poll that was just taken recently. It said only 38% of Americans are actually satisfied with their life. That means far more people are unsatisfied or dissatisfied than there's, there are those that are satisfied. Scientists have a term that describes what these students and millions of others are experiencing. It's called depersonalization. This is a new word to me. It's called depersonalization. And what it means is when a person feels detached from the thoughts, emotions, and feelings. You can live your life, but you're detached from it. And the results of this is you become shorter, not tall-wise, short-tempered, you anger easily, you have a tough time connecting on an emotional level with other people, you're detached. You're detached from your own feelings. And I would go as far as to say this is an epidemic in our country because many people are not living satisfied lives. And the answer to that or the question is why aren't they living satisfied lives? Why aren't people content? It all comes down to purpose. Do you have a life purpose? Do you have a life purpose? I believe that every person on the planet has a God-given purpose. And until you find that purpose, you will never be happy. So how do we find it? The answer is to know your shape. But King Solomon, let me just back up a little bit. King Solomon talked about depersonalization 5,000 years ago, and he wrote this in Ecclesiastes. It's recorded in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. This is King Solomon. Solomon had everything. Wealthiest man that ever lived. Made Bill Gates look like a putz. Had everything. He had, he had wives. He had, um, he had money, material things, anything. Servants, everything he could have ever wanted, he had. And he writes this. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Nothing was gained under the sun. Why is this? It's because people lack purpose. And nowadays, a lot of people are trying to find their purpose in experiences. So it's always about doing the next experience to find happiness. My wife and I have an Airbnb that we rent out. And, uh, and one of the things that the company is always pushing is you need, to, you need to give people an experience. So like if you have something cool like a rope swing or on a lake or a boat or, or you're an incredible chef, you should cook them a meal and you sell the experience because people are so looking for these different experiences. I just sell a place. <laughs> I don't do all the other stuff, but I did have one idiot one time went into my garage and saw my motorcycle and four-wheeler there and he's like, hey, does this come with a place, right? We can use this? I'm like, no, you moron, that's mine. I responded politely, though, like, uh, no, dummy. But, but people are looking for experiences. But, and then Solomon says this in chapter 3. He says, what do workers gain from their toil? I've seen the burden as God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. That's, we deep down inside know that we are not just created for the here and now. There's something in every one of us that knows that there is an eternity. We can't help it. It's this heartbeat. That we know it. And because we have this heartbeat and eternity is in our hearts, there must be a purpose, a reason for living now. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil, this is a gift of God. It is a gift of God to live a satisfied life. It's a gift. It's a gift. So how do we do that? Will you find your shape? Shape stands for this. Spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. And when you understand your unique shape and you put that into, you integrate that into your life, you will be satisfied. So let me break it down. Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts is this. 
Spiritual gifts are a special God-given ability that is given to every believer at conversion by the Holy Spirit to share his love and to strengthen the body of Christ. If you are a believer, you have a spiritual gift. God has given you a spiritual gift that is to be used for his glory. He gives you a gift. This is not a natural ability. This is a God-given spiritual gift that is used for his glory. In 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verse 10, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So you use your spiritual gift for the glory of God. Give an example, like Chris and Maggie, who are here now, they're missionaries in Papua New Guinea. You're using your spiritual gifts, which is speaking in other languages, namely pidgin and what's the tribal language called? Paul. The Paul language, in the, in, and they speak pidgin, it's called pidgin in Papua New Guinea. And listening to their family talk to these people in their native language completely baffles me. But you guys are gifted for it. That's your, your gifting. You're good at it. I look at other people. You know, I even look at Stephanie, who's in the, you're not in the front row, by the way. You're in the second row this week. That's okay. But you're using your gifts that God has given you to minister God's grace. I look at Ashley Spang. She runs the furniture depot. She's using her gifts of administration to do that. I look at, I look at so many other people who are using their gifts, and our ushers, our greeters, even our aid and our cameraman back there. You're doing a great job using your gifts, right? So God lays on your heart. For me, I never dreamed of being a pastor my whole life, ever. Some of you wish that never came true either. <laughs> but now I'm speaking, but God laid that on my heart. That was a spiritual gift that God gave me of leadership and the ability to preach and teach. I didn't have that before. That's a God-given spiritual gift. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul writes, now, each one, uh, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And then he goes on and he defines it even more. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. In, uh, to prepare God's people for works of service that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So you might not really know what your spiritual gift is. If you do, that's awesome. But, but if you don't, you can discover your own spiritual gifting. Here's a uh, picture of a couple of websites that you can go to if you want to take this assessment. And by the way, don't do the bottom one because that costs money. But the top one is free. So take out your phone Take a picture of it. If you can scan it, that's great. But if you want to take a free spiritual gifts test, it takes about eight minutes. It'll help you discover what your spiritual gift is. And for many of you, it's like an aha moment. If you don't know what your gift is, you take it. You're like, no wonder why I like that so much. I didn't used to like that, but now I do. It's something when you discover it, you're like, man, this is awesome. It's part of aligning with God's purpose for your life. And that's where you find that satisfaction. Here's some of the, the spiritual gifts that are listed in the scriptures. This is 20 of them, and I don't believe this is necessarily an exhaustive list. But there's administration, apostleship, discernment, all of these different gifts. You ever been around someone who has the gift of faith? Anyone here have the gift of faith? Okay, a bunch of you do. So when you who have the gift of faith, you're inspiring to be around because no matter what's going on, you're like, we're just going to trust God through this. And everyone else is like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about having faith. And you, you inspire other people when you use your spiritual gift of faith or knowledge. Some of you also have mercy. When you truly care about the down and outers, this week I met with a group that does some work, uh, well, a lot of work actually, in, a, in an inner city. And in this inner city, uh, I, when I was meeting with this pastor, he says to me, he says, these people smell so bad, they don't change their clothes, they have nothing to give. And he goes, and I love serving them. That's a spiritual gift that God gave him. You think he would have said that before he was a Christian? No. But it's a gift that God has given him. Or the gift of wisdom or teacher or pastors. All of these are different spiritual gifts. And you have one of them. Then there's heart. That's the H. The special passions that God has given you that you can glorify him on earth. And the Bible uses the term heart oftentimes to describe your personality, the, or not personality, but, but your passions, the essence of what, what you desire, your passion. Everyone here is passionate about something. I mean, might be about the Vikings. Good luck with that. 
Could it be about the twins? I mean, you're passionate about something. What is it that you're really passionate about? Where your heart just, when, when something moves in you, you just long to be a part of that, like, because you're passionate about it. I want you just for a second, just to let yourself dream. There's no boundaries on this, but just dream and say, God, if I could do anything for you, if I could serve or make a difference in any way, this is what I'm passionate about. What is God laying on your heart? Like, what is it that you just love to do? You, you crave it, you long for it. It might be incredibly difficult, but when you're done, you're so satisfied. You have a heart for it. So often we don't follow our heart because we, we say, oh, I can't do that because of this and I can't do it because of that and this, it, it'll never do this. And, and we, we rule ourselves out when maybe God has birthed the passion in you for something, he wants you to use it for him. You gotta follow that passion. Because when you follow that passion, that's what results in satisfaction. The apostle Paul, he was Jewish. And he spoke to Jews, but after he had come to Christ, he had a passion to reach Gentiles. That's anyone who wasn't Jewish. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire, in other words, I'm passionate about this, and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. So he was passionate for the Israelites, but he was also very passionate for the Gentiles. Very passionate for them. And then you have the abilities, that's the A. The abilities uh, are the set of talents that God gave you when you were born, which he also wants you to use to make an impact for him. There's an echo like in my head. Can you guys hear that or is it just me? You can hear it too? Okay. Thanks for fixing it. So you have your abilities. And you can use and develop your own natural abilities because you're naturally born, you're talented at many, many things, right? You can use that and leverage it for the glory of God. For example, you see a lot of pro athletes that come out for a huddle, a prayer huddle, uh, on the 50-yard line, if you use a football, or, or others that win the Olympics, and they say, first and foremost, I want to give all glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When they say that, they're using their platform to leverage their abilities. But you have certain abilities, and God wants you to use those abilities to glorify Him and to build the body up. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says this, so each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. And then there's your personality. So S-H-A-P. P is your personality. The special way that God has wired you to navigate life and to fulfill your unique kingdom purpose. You have a unique personality. Some of you very unique personalities. But God wants to use that to leverage it for his glory. You look in the Bible, and, and the Bible doesn't teach specifically on personalities, but you read all about them when you, when you read the scriptures. Like Moses. Moses had a temper. I mean, he killed an Egyptian, and then God calls him out. He's, he wants him to lead, and then Moses is leading, and, and at one point Moses is like, Dear God, thank you. Thank you so much for all the things. And on another hand, he's like, God, why did you stick these stubborn people with me? I can't stand them. You could read that. So that's his personality, yet God still used him. He used King David, he used Solomon, he used Peter. Peter was a fisherman. He didn't have any filter. He had no muffler, we call that. He just spoke all the time. God used that. He became a spokesperson for the church. Why? Because that's his personality. He, he was wired for it. You have a unique personality. My wife worked for 23 years with intellectually disabled people. That's her personality. She's had a heart for it, passionate about it. And, but her personality is such that she's so patient and kind, and, and it worked well. Now she does books, and she's patient and kind and does well at that too. You make me do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'd rather staple my head to the carpet. <laughs> it's, we're different personalities that we all have. So you can use your personality. I like being a police chaplain. I enjoy serving our communities. And sometimes I meet people in the worst of the worst situations, and it's gut-wrenching, but there's something about it that I like. That's how I'm wired. I can't help that. You're wired in a unique way, too. Very unique ways and experiences. These are the parts of your past, both positive and painful, that God intends to use in great ways. 
In the book of Genesis, there's a story of a man named Joseph. Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. From there, uh, he became a slave in another land. From there, he was accused of accosting a woman, thrown into jail. He didn't do any of it. And he found himself in prison. And after this long stint in prison, finally he, he gets out and, and, and God restores him. And then he meets his family, the very people that sold him into slavery. And he says this to them. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God used Joseph to save tens of thousands of people's lives through a famine. He moved him there. He used him even through all of that pain. You know, the pain in your life God can use for his glory. Women, if you've gone through a miscarriage, I'm so sorry. But God can still use that to minister to someone else who's going through a miscarriage or just experienced one. If you were sexually abused, was that God's will? No, it was not God's will at all. It's because we have free will in this world. But God can use that for you to minister to other people who have experienced it. If you've gone through the pain of a divorce, God can use that to help someone else who's in the midst of agony and suffering now. If you've gone through cancer, if you've lost someone before it was time, he can use that and will use that if you just let him. You have to just hand that over to God. Look at Stephanie in your video and how God used your past. Now you said, uh, what would you say? My, my, my past used to be my greatest weakness and now it's my greatest strength. That's awesome. It's amazing what God does. And you all have stories too. What God has done in your life He's used the good things too. If you've been successful in areas, you can mentor other people. You can help them. God uses our experiences. You just have to give it to him. So you have your spiritual gifts. You have your uh, heart, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences. And once you figure all of that out and you just surrender that to God, that is where you're going to find satisfaction in life because you are unique and I really believe that so many people are unsettled in their life and not satisfied. It's because they simply have lost their purpose in knowing that God has plans and purpose for you. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, you have a unique shape. You have a unique shape. In Psalm 139, this is one of my go-to verses. It says this, for you created my in inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Someone needed to hear that today. But God has created you unique for his glory. That you are not an accident, that you have meaning and purpose and value. And when you understand your shape and you use it for the glory of God, you will be the most satisfied that you have ever been. God, help us to stay to learn our shape. I thank you, God, that you have fearfully and wonderfully made us, that we are created, God, for your glory. And I pray right now for that, that person that needed to hear that, that verse, that you created us unique and special to be used for your glory. God, I pray today that we will stop trying to be someone else, stop trying to model our life after someone else that we look up to or think are more popular or better, but that we will embrace the very shape that you have made us, that we won't try to live our life wishing we were someone else, but that we will find total contentment in who you created us to be. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.